Hey, thanks for clicking in. Around here, we upload videos each and every week. So make sure you hit that subscribe button for your weekly dose of encouragement. As you're watching this message, you may feel led to get connected to our ministry. Make sure you check out the description box below to find out how to do just that. As you're watching, you may also want to give to our ministry. There are many ways to do so, so utilize what works for you. Thanks for partnering with us. Now, let's check it out. Today, I want to talk to you on the topic of identity. You see, many of us have formed our identity throughout the course of our life. There have been experiences that we have, we have experienced, good and bad, that have shaped who we are. We have walked boldly in the identity of our families and our friends, the groups that we have been a part of. We've also created our identity out of our accomplishments, our degrees, our education, the letters behind our name, the families that we have. We have new titles as mom, as dad, as godmother, as godfather, as grandparent. And with each of those life-changing moments, our identity shifts and our identity changes. But the thing is, with God, our identity was never meant to mimic the things that we see on the outside or the things that we experience. You see, in God, there is one single identity that he wants for every single one of us in which he has designed us to walk in. But sometimes if we take on all of the external things that we walk into and we have them create our identity, when things are going well, we're excited. We're walking up to people. We're telling them all the great things that we're doing. We're telling them all the great things our family is doing. But when things aren't going necessarily how we planned or how we thought, we start to question ourselves. We start to question our motives. We start to question our purpose. And we start to question whether or not God is still with us. And God never intended for us to take on the identity of many things, but he wanted us to walk and what he created us to be. Now you see for me, one of my earliest memories, because sometimes our identity is shaped by traumatic experiences that may happen to us. And for me, one of my earliest memories, one of my earliest experience was the absence of my father. You see from ages newborn to about five, he was there, present, I was like his little mini-me because we looked just alike, so it was, it was great. And we formed this unbreakable bond, so I thought. But by the time I got to about age five or six, life happened. And when life happened, it seemed as though my father just disappeared. It felt like he was no longer there and I didn't know why. He was alive. He was breathing. I was really close with my dad's side of the family. So I was always at family reunions, always at cookouts. My cousin group, you know, the diehard cousin groups that we're a part of, we were all the same age, so it was perfect. But for some reason, even having that voided, void filled by them, it didn't fill the abandonment and void that I felt with my father just not being present. And I remember thinking as an early child, like, it has to be a reason. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm not a good daughter. Maybe there are things that are about me that he just doesn't like. And maybe, 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 if I could change some of the things about myself, then maybe it would convince him that I was good enough. Maybe it would convince him that, you know what, she is smart enough to be my daughter. Now, listen, I know that sounds crazy, but when you're a child, you make up things because you can't explain what's happening. And so I would, every few years, I would have a new sibling. And that caused even more trauma because I'm like, oh, so maybe he's having other kids because the first kid that he had wasn't enough. And so I started doing different things. I would say, you know what, I'm going to be the best athlete there is. And if you know me still to this day, I'm a big sport fan. So I'm going to be the best athlete there is. I'm going to walk into every practice. I'm going to give it 100%. And that paid off. Because I was getting awards, I was getting high fives, I was getting little uh, write-ups in the newspaper, and to me, I was like, yes, the newspaper. Everybody's dad reads the newspaper. I would go into school and I would get good grades, I would be elevated into honors classes and into AP classes, and I'm thinking, yes, surely he's gonna see I'm smart enough. 
And all of these things I was trying to do to try and justify why I was good enough. And it impacted all the close relationships that I had, even the relationship with my mom, because surely if he could disown me, that's what I felt, then she could too. And she didn't. My mom was amazing. But that's how I felt as a child. And then just a few years later, I would be boasting about my grades, because you know we boast about the things that we try to get people to see so we can hide the insecurities that we have. And I was talking to my aunt one day, and I was super excited. And unfortunately, her kids weren't doing as well in school. But she goes, you know what? She looked me square in my face. She said, you know what? You're going to fail one day. And when you fail, you're going to keep failing, just like your dad. I was only 10 or 11. I was shifting. I was, everything was changing. My body was changing. I was getting ready to go to a new middle school. My whole world was changing. And so all of a sudden, her insecurities were now passed on to me, and I couldn't get out of it. So what did I do? I kept working. I'm still going to be the best athlete, because somebody for sure is going to look at me and say, she is great. I'm going to keep trying to get the good grades. A lot of people say, oh, you're super smart. You got all these grades. It was a trauma response, OK? <laughs> but I kept going and kept doing it anyway. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I really started to understand that I wasn't the things that I did or that I didn't do, but I was only the person that God had called me to be. And it wasn't until I was in my 20s when I really started getting in his word and I really started to ask God, like, who am I? What have you called me to? What am I supposed to do in this world? Because it's unclear. And I feel like you've placed me in this situation not feeling the love and appreciation that I, I thought that I, I should have. Not that I earned it, but that I, that I should have. And maybe this morning, your story isn't mine. Maybe it's something else has occurred, whether you were a child, whether you were in your teenage years, whether you were in your 20s, your 30s, your 40s. Maybe something has occurred that when you wake up in the morning, you look in the mirror and you don't even recognize who you see. Maybe something has shifted in your life. Maybe it was a loss that all of a sudden you have now become something that you never intended for yourself to be. Maybe it was a relationship that went bad, and now you are looking at yourself in a different view. Maybe you are questioning whether God sees you, whether or not God sees you, whether or not he hears the cries that you have, whether or not he hears the negative thoughts that go in and out of your mind. Maybe this morning your story isn't mine, but your story is still a story of not understanding who you are. Today, I want to encourage you through the life of Gideon to see yourself how God sees you. I want to encourage you through the life of Gideon to get ready to walk in the power and purpose God has given you. And I want to encourage you through his story to trust that if God has brought you here this morning, if he woke you up this morning, the promise and purpose that he has for you, the plan that he has for you is still on track. When we meet Gideon, when we first see him in this story, it says that he was up on a mountain threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, to give you some backstory and give you some context, the Israelites, who, who are Gideon's people, they had been freed from bondage, freed from slavery, but they always found themselves in this cycle. It was a cycle of trusting God, knowing God, loving God, and then they would fall back into some of their old ways and they would doubt God, they would worship false idols, they would do all kinds of things. And God finally got to a point where he was like, you know what, this is a little too much. And so he allowed an enemy called the Midianites and the Amalekites to come in and to attack his people for seven years. For seven years. Now, if you don't know anything about the Amalekites and the Midianites, these were two of the biggest and baddest armies around. And the crazy thing is they didn't even like each other. And that's a whole other sermon. That's a whole other message for another day that sometimes your enemies are going to get together and they're going to try to attack you. But usually that means that God has something up his sleeve. Yeah. Usually that means he's going to turn some things around quickly. And he just needs to get your perspective right 
so that you can see exactly who he is in the situation. They were in this cycle, and they were in this cycle because they had a misplaced identity. They were living in a way that was opposite of what God had promised them and opposite of what God had shown them. You see, they knew that they were the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They knew that God had given them the earth and they were to be blessed through it. They knew that they were the descendants of Moses and Joshua, so they were to walk into the promised land. But yet, somewhere along the way, their identity got shifted, and they started doing things that were outside of what God had planned for them. And sometimes, this morning, you may be in a place where you're like, you know what, I know all the promises that God has for me. I've walked in them. I've touched them. I've seen them. But somewhere along the way, I got lost. Somewhere along the way, I just made the wrong decision. Somewhere along the way, I thought it was the right decision, but I'm looking and I don't, I don't recognize myself. And this has forced them to the side of a mountain where we find Gideon. And it says that he was threshing wheat in a wine press. Now, threshing wheat typically happened in open air, well-ventilated areas. But he was doing this in an unconventional way, using a tool, excuse me, using a tool that he wasn't supposed to be using. If you've ever seen a wine press, it is a little kind of hole in the ground. It looks like a pit. It's not well ventilated. You have Gideon almost taking on the identity of his people. He's living in defeat. He's living in a place doing things that he typically wouldn't have done. And he's just sitting there doing this repetitive job over and over and over again. And it says year after year, the Midianites would come and destroy their crops. It said year after year, they would come and take down all of their towns. And year after year, Gideon was doing the same repetitive thing that was not necessarily what God had intended for him to do. And the reason why he is doing this, it says because he was in fear of the Midianites. Sometimes when we are walking through life, we are living in an identity or we've taken on this posture that God never intended for us. We'll do things that we never intended to do, but we will also find ourselves being in isolation. You see, Gideon was by himself. There was no one else around while he's doing this mindless job to try and support his family. And sometimes in our life, we may find ourselves just going through the wheel of life. We get up, we go to work. We do the things we need to. We take care of the kids. We come home. We go to sleep. We find ourselves in this cycle, but we also find ourselves in this cycle with all the people around but still feeling alone, still feeling like we're by ourselves, that no one around us could possibly see what's going on. And when we hide, it's not just hide as physical hiding, stay in the house. No, we hide behind smiles. We hide behind our accomplishments. We hide behind all of the physical things that we try to make people believe that we're OK when we're not. We hide because we don't want people to ask the dreaded question of, are you OK? Because the first response will be, yeah, I'm OK. But then when we stand there a little bit longer and they say, no, are you OK, you start to break down. This morning, God wants you to stop hiding. He wants you to walk in what he has called you, and he knows the situation that you're in right now. You're taking care of everybody else, but he's trying to say, I brought you here this morning because I want to take care of you. Yeah. Because when I get your eyes to see who you really are, you're going to realize that the cycle wasn't meant to define you. The cycle was meant to get you to a place where you could see more of him, and as you see more of him, you'll be able to trust in the path that he has for you. You're not meant to just be in this cycle all the time of believing and trusting in God and then not believing and trusting in him and believing and trusting him and not believing and trusting in him. No, you're meant to live a life that is fully capable of walking in what God has called you to. And so Gideon is weary and Gideon is afraid. You may know what suffering and having things taken from you feels like. You may know what it feels like to kind of walk and do the mundane things of life and feel like no one else sees you. But God sees you. 
He sees you right where you are. He hasn't lost you. He knows how long it's been since you felt like yourself. He knows how long it's been since you felt that ick in your side that just made you want to curl over and cry. He knows what it feels like when you are walking a path that you feel like you have no idea what you are doing. And he said, I've come to you this morning to encourage you that not only have I heard you, not only have I seen what you are going through, but I'm coming straight to you this morning. Yes. I'm coming straight to you because what happens is in, in verse 11, it says that the, the spirit of the Lord or the angel of the Lord came. The angel of the Lord didn't call Gideon out to, to come where he was. The angel of the Lord came right to where he was. You may feel like you're in a place that's far from where God intended you to be, but God said, I know exactly where you are. I have a compass that shows me your exact location. The seat that you are sitting in right now, God's not sitting right next to you. He's right in front of you. It says the angel of the Lord came and sat down. And then I love what verse 12 says because it puts things into perspective. In verse 12, it then says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. So the angel of the Lord came, but Gideon didn't see him. Because then it wouldn't say, and then the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon. Sometimes God is saying, I am right here, and I don't think you see me. Yeah. I see you. I've been walking with you ever since. I'm sitting right next to you. I see you. But do you see me? Because if you saw me, your whole perspective of this situation would change. If you saw me, you would know that not only are you not by yourself, but the angel of the Lord and the angel armies is all on your side this morning. You are not by yourself. You are not alone. I don't care what the enemy tries to tell you. I don't understand and I don't care what he's trying to get you to believe that the Lord has left you, that the things you are experiencing is because of yourself. No, the Lord said, I took all of that into consideration because you, I had a plan for you before you were in your mother's womb, which means everything that could ever happen to you, I'm right there. Your circumstances, your experiences are not meant to define who you are. It says the angel of the Lord came and appeared to Gideon. And the first thing he says is the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. He didn't have to start like that. But he started like that because it makes me believe that Gideon truly didn't believe that the Lord was with him. You are never so far away from God that he will never be with you. Amen. For we are the dwelling place of the Lord. Yeah. So wherever you step, he is there. Yeah. Whatever you get into, he is there. Yeah. The angel of the Lord came and it said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I love the King James version of this because it says you mighty valor. Now this doesn't make sense at all because up to this point, Gideon hadn't been in any physical battle. He hadn't put on not one piece of armor but the Lord called him a mighty warrior and a mighty man of valor. Valor means someone who has courage, someone who is brave, especially when it came to battle. So why would God call him this when he wasn't that? He was simply threshing wheat in a wine press. And this leads me to believe that God is oftentimes not only going to tell you he is with you, but he's going to call you something that he already has labeled you as. It doesn't matter what people have to say about you. It doesn't matter what your circumstances have to say about you. You are who God has called you to be. And there is nothing else that can come of that. God said you are a mighty man of valor. God is saying this morning that you are a mighty woman of valor, a mighty man of valor. And can't anybody tell you anything different? Because if they do, I know that the angel of the Lord is coming through and the sword of the Lord is swift. God said, I'm calling you something that I know you don't believe. 
but I have to get it to you first yes. so that when I tell you what I have for you, you're yes. going to have the confidence to yes. walk in it. Yes. He called him a mighty man of valor. And I think he did this for two reasons. And I think there are two reasons that apply to us today. I think he called Gideon a mighty man of valor and a mighty warrior because he had to prepare Gideon for where he was about to take him. How you are identifying yourself today isn't going to keep you where God wants to take you. He has to elevate you. We pray, God, I want these blessings. God, if you just did this, if you got me this job, if you got me this opportunity, if you got me this family. But God's saying, I need to change your perspective of who you are because you're not going to be able to maintain and sustain at the level that I have you at. I have to bring you up, so I have to prepare you for where I'm about to send you. And then I think the second reason why this is the case is, although Gideon hadn't been in any physical battle, there was a battle taking place in his mind. Some of us, I heard pastors say this uh, time and time again, some of us are heart people, some of us are mind people. Heart people, when things hit you, it takes an emotional toll on you. But for mind people, there are things that go through your mind day in and day out things that are convincing you of things that are simply not true. And I feel like God was trying to convince Gideon that even before I take you into the physical battle, I'm going to give you the victory over the battle that's going on in your mind. I'm going to give you the victory over the negative thoughts that keeps plugging your mind, whether you are good enough, whether you're a good enough mom, a good enough wife, a good enough daughter, a good enough husband, a good enough father, a good enough worker, a good enough owner. God is saying you are good enough. And put it this way, you're not good enough. You're exceeding and abundantly above the word good. He's trying to tell Gideon, I know there are things that are going on between your ears that causes you to wake up in the morning and you have a million things going on. You have a million things to get done. And I know, I know sometimes you try to spend time with God, but you have things going on all in your mind and you fall asleep because your brain is just tired of all the things that are happening and God's saying, I need you to just pump the brakes. I need you to just take a moment to be silent and to believe who I am calling you to be. The battle that's going on in your mind is just the work of the enemy trying to get you distracted so that you can win the battle he has going on with God. The only reason you have a battle going on inside of you is because there's purpose in you. And so God's calling him a mighty man of valor. I'm preparing you, Gideon. I'm not only preparing you, but I'm telling you that the things that are going on in your mind will subside because I've given you power and victory over them. It's incredible. In Proverbs 27, 3, it says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. What you think drives your decisions day in and day out. The negative things that may come in and that may come out, those are driving what you are doing with your life, what you are doing with those God has entrusted you with, and he's trying to get you to get a renewed mind, a renewed sense of who you are, a renewed perspective. And I love in Jeremiah where it says, it says this in Jeremiah 1, 5. It says, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Mm. I don't think y'all know how good that is. Yeah. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Yeah. Before you were born, I set you apart. You think you're alone? Come on. <laughs> you think you are by yourself? No, God set you apart. Yeah. He said you are not like anyone else. Yeah. You are specifically and beautifully and wonderfully made just for the purpose that I have for you because I knew you before any of the outer attributes of yourself came forth. Yeah. He said, I knew you before you were born. I set you apart, and I appointed you. What? I'm telling you, I don't think y'all understand how God knew you. He set you apart, and he appointed you. He knew you. He set you apart, and he anointed you. 
That means nothing anyone could do, yes. nothing anyone could say, nothing that has ever come against you, no experience that you may have experienced can take you out of the appointed purpose that God has for you. Yes. Nothing can. I mean, absolutely nothing. I laugh and I smile because I know the things that tried to take me out. And I know that God said, no, nah, you can't touch her there. No, you can't touch her there. You can't say those things. You can say them, but it's just going to give her more power for what she's trying to do. Remember, I told you, it wasn't the words that then made me cuddle into a, a ball and cry. No, those words said, I'm going to be the best athlete. And guess what? When you become a great athlete, you also become a great leader in the locker room. Yeah. You also get to speak life into the people and encourage them. So sometimes you want to be encouraged, but sometimes you just got to encourage some other people so that they can get to where God is trying to have them. You know what also comes out of that? Confidence comes out of being the best player. Confidence comes out of being the best player. You get to be in team environments where you get to now pull people up. They are excited about what's happening. The enemy thought that he was going to say some things that were going to get me off track, but really he set me up. He set me up, and God knew it. God knew it. He thought he was trying to set me back, but what ended up happening is, yeah, I got the good grades. Yeah, I went to school, and it was all good and dandy, but now it puts me in a position to say, I know how we can help this community. I know what we can try to do to strategize and put these things together. I know what it looks like to kind of, okay, I think we can do this. I think we can go talk to this business. I think we can go talk to this company. The enemy thought, he thinks that he has you in a chokehold, but really God is saying, I let that happen to you because I'm trying to get you elevated to the place that I have for you. You see, oh, I love God. I truly love God because not only did he know us, he set us apart and, and he has appointed every single one of you. Your purpose is so important. I know there are things that plague your mind day in and day out, but God needs you. He needs you. There are things coming against you that are going to try to get you outside of his will. But the reason why you are here today, and not just in this building, but here on this earth, is because his will is still moving forward. Yeah. When God sees you, he doesn't see what everyone else sees. When God sees you, he sees you just how the scripture says. He says you are chosen. He said you are set apart. He said that you are the head and not the tail. He said that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. He said you are holy. He said that you, you are the one that he has called. And if he has called you something, you have to get up and walk in that thing. You can't let anything stop you. You can't let words stop you. You can't let people stop you. You can't let circumstances stop you. When he has called you chosen, when he has called you set apart, when he has called you to be the person, oh, then he's mad. That's okay. Because some people are getting up this morning and they are walking in what God has specifically said that you are. You are not a mistake. You are not something that God forgot. You are not something he looked over. No, you are to walk in what God has called you because you, you are important for his will. And not only are you important for his will, you were designed. You were designed, handcrafted before he knew, before the world knew you, before that person who hurt you knew you. Before that circumstance that came hurt you, God said, I knew what was going to happen and I planned for it. Yeah. Now I just need you to see who you are so you can walk in it. Yeah. When you start walking in it, things start to change. Your perspective starts to change. I'm okay. I love who I am. You know what I mean? It's funny. Uh, Amaris is in the back and uh, Pastor will laugh. They'll say things like, I'll do quirky things and I'm okay. And I'll be like... I love who I am. Yeah. I am comfortable with quirks and all. Yeah. I know who I am. But it was only because I really started to believe in the words that God has spoken over me. 
I have this much energy because I want you to believe what God has spoken over you. Yeah. And it says that once Gideon got all this energy and he said, all right, I'm going to give this thing a try. And God said, okay, I got a task for you, Gideon. And in uh, 14 through 15, thank you, it says, the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have, save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? And Gideon says, whoa, wait, wait a second. I know you were giving me this identity thing, and I was, I was, I was with it, but um, <laughs> that's how I read the Bible. <laughs> um, but uh, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. After all this, Gideon is saying, God, I don't know. I'm trying to believe, but how is this going to happen? And this is Gideon trying to disqualify himself from what God is trying to send him into. How many times have you disqualified yourself because what God showed you was bigger than what you thought you could do? Gideon's trying to disqualify himself, and that's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants you to disqualify yourself because then you're doing his job for him. Because he can't disqualify you from anything that God has for you. If he spoke it over you, if you felt it in your heart, if you've heard it in your mind at any point in life, that's because God said it was yours. And so anytime the enemy tries to get you to believe something other than that, you know he's just trying to get you. You see, I know why I had to be attacked as a young child. I know I had to be attacked as a young child because the enemy had to try to get me as early as possible. Because he knew that if I were to ever get my identity right, then not only would my family change, as we're going to see when Gideon gets his mind right, but whole countries would be changed. And I haven't gotten there yet, but I believe in the promises of God, and I know what he has shown me, and I know the change that's going to happen because I'm walking in my power and might. What has God called you? And what is the enemy trying to get you to believe to change your perspective of what God has called you? And he's deceiving. He doesn't just come out and flat out and tell you you're not enough. Um, You're not beautiful enough. You're not smart enough. No, he doesn't come out and say that. He asks a question. Do you think you're smart enough for that? Uh, I mean, you did that before, but you think you can do it again? It was hard. Um, I know God promised this, but do you really think he promised that? Because your life don't look like what he promised. He'll ask you questions, and you'll answer the questions, not realizing that it's not your thought that's asking you. And that's why in 2 Corinthians it says you have to hold every thought captive, because not every thought is yours. You can probably tell I'm the mind, the mind person. I am a heart person. I love people. But I'm a mind person. And the enemy can do anything on the outside. I can tackle it. It's cool. All right. There's crisis happening here. That's fine. I can walk in. I can help. I can, I can offer what I can. But when this starts to get all jacked up, it shuts my whole world down. How many of you this morning are disqualifying yourself based off of the thoughts that you think? And most importantly, the thoughts that you think about yourself sometimes. Can I really do this? God bless me with this family, but can I really do this? God bless me with this job and this opportunity, but can I really do? Yes, you can. Because if he gave it to you, it's yours. If he gave it to you. It's not just because he promised it and he was just like, you know what? They've been a good Christian lately. Let me just handle this to them. No, he already knew at what moment he was going to drop that opportunity in your lap. He already knew what moment he was going to say, I think they're ready for the next step. Stop letting the enemy disqualify you from something he has no power over. No power. And so finally, Gideon gets another pep talk. And he's like, all right. I'm going to do it. The first place that he stops is at his father's house. And in his father's house, he takes down 
all of the false idols that his people were worshiping, which got God angry in the first place. And when I tell you this is something that we need to learn from Gideon, sometimes we're going to be scared, and that's okay. But we got to walk anyway. Amen. Sometimes we're going to be afraid, and we might have to, like, scoot around, yeah. you know, <laughs> peek around a couple corners. But that's okay. Keep going anyway. Yeah. Because your confidence is going to grow as you step. Each step is a step of confidence. Each step, you're starting to get a new perspective. Each step, you're moving closer to where God already has predestined for you. And so he tore down all the idols. And the next morning, it says all these people wanted to come and kill Gideon. And his father stepped in and said, no. Nah, if this false idol can come down and handle his own business, then sure, but y'all aren't going to touch him. His father was one of the people that was worshiping this idol. In just a moment, it just took Gideon to walk. Walk while he was scared. Walk while he wasn't unsure. But as he was walking, God was moving. And while he was walking, God was changing his father's heart. While you're walking and while you're moving and what God has called you to do, your whole family is changing and you don't even realize it because you have that power. No one else has that power. You have that power to make that shift. And sometimes we look at ourselves and say, why God me? Why couldn't it be the next person? Why not you? Why not you? He has called you. You are strong enough and bold enough to do the things that God has called you to. And so Gideon gets some more energy. All right, I see you, God. I see you moving. And he says, okay, come on, boys. It's time for us to go down and get ready to uh, win this battle that, you know, the Lord, the angel of the Lord said we're going to win. Um, I'm still hesitant, but you know what? We're going to do it. <laughs> and it says he gathers 32,000 men, and they go down to this place called Herod. And as he gets there, the Lord said, oh, yeah, this is Gideon Spring. It's Herod and Gideon Spring. Um, we went there a few years ago. Really cool experience. Um, so he takes his boys down, and God said, all right, all right, all right. I, uh, Gideon, I have two cuts that I need to make. And I have two cuts because it's too many of y'all. And I know that if, because I already gave you the victory, so I already know the outcome. And I know that if I let all of y'all go down, you're going to come back and say that you did it for yourself. And so God said, I got to make two cuts. So the first cut that he makes is he says, okay, Gideon, for anyone who is scared or afraid, send them home. Gideon said, okay. Any of y'all that are scared and afraid, uh, I need y'all to leave. And it says 22,000 left. Wow. Now, what's really important is, remember I said they went down to this place called Herod. The meaning of Herod is fear. Gideon took them to a place that possessed his old identity because it was familiar to him. And God said, I can't have you bring your new identity into the victory that I'm about to give you. I need you to shed some things that aren't like you, because if they all go with you, then you're going to claim the victory for yourself. And at some point, you're going to come right back to this cycle that you've been in and own the fear that I have already given you victory over. Sometimes the people that are in your sphere right now, if their identity don't match where you're going, you have to be bold enough to say, not in this season. I got to leave you here. I got to leave you here. And it's not that they're bad people. It's just I can't have you going where I'm going if there's a potential you could pull me back. I have victory over what the enemy has already tried so hard to distract me with. I can't take you with me. And what's so important about this, too, is that if you aren't careful... While you're walking and stepping and your faith is growing and your identity is growing, you have to be careful about the people that are following you. Your family is following you. 
your community is following you? And are you replicating an environment on the outside that replicates something that you feel on the inside? We already said it's false. But if we aren't careful, our spirit of fear could overtake and overpower the people that are around us who may not have a strong spirit in this season. Yeah. And so you have to be careful. Although you're walking, you have to create environments that aren't going to allow people to also live in their past as well. Yeah. So God gave the first cut. And then God said, all right, I have one more cut for you, Gideon. And I have, to, I have to think that, again, this is how I read the Bible. I feel like Gideon was like, uh, hold up. Because it's 140,000 of them. You just cut down my army. Now we're 10,000. The math is not mathing at all. And God said, just trust me. I have one more cut for you. And he said, OK, because you, you, you did what you said you were going to do there. I'm trusting we have the victory. So I'm trusting you have a plan. And God said, OK, I need you to take them down to the, to the riverside. And if they drink water a certain way, I need you to send them home. Wow. Huh? <laughs> if they drink water a certain OK, all right. I'm, I'm trusting you, God. All right. And it says that 97,000 of them left. So wow. Gideon is now left with 300. Whoa. 300 to 140,000. And Gideon said, listen, this is your plan. So if we go down, <laughs> it's your fault. Uh, you did all this work in me. I have to believe that your plan is good and yeah. it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. And so it says he takes his 300 and they go down and they wipe out the Midianites. They get them all confused. And the crazy thing is they're not using weapons. They're not using things that you think would be necessary in a battle. They are using horns and just stuff that doesn't even make sense. And what I love about this is it doesn't matter what's in your hands. Yeah. If God has already given you the victory, then that means you have the victory over the thing that he has given you. It doesn't matter the circumstances that are around you. When God has already said you have the victory, you have to walk in it and be excited about it. Because it's not going to look like what you think it's going to look like. It's not going to sound like how it's going to sound like. But God says, I already spoke the word. And the amazing thing is, he spoke that word before Gideon was even formed. There's things God has already spoken over you. You have to be excited yeah. to just walk sometimes. You might have a limp when you walk. You might have a pain in your side, in your hip, in your shoulder. You might have things going on in your body. God said, keep walking. Yeah. If I promised it to you, it's because it is yours. Yeah. It is yours. You know, I heard this analogy not long ago, and it said, you know, um, there's a reason why private jets only seat a certain amount of people and only allow a certain amount of baggage. It's not like economy. When you're riding in a private jet, you're asking God, I want, I want you to elevate me. I want you to take me to new heights. But God's saying there's some baggage that you're holding on to that can't go with you. Yeah. And some of that baggage are people. Yeah. I know you love them. Yeah. They're not bad people. They just aren't God's people in this season for where he's trying to take yeah. you. Yeah. Later on in the story, later on in the story, it says that as they started to win, thousands of other Israelites started to join. Thousands. And I'm pretty sure that some of those thousands were the ones that God had taken uh, Gideon or asked him to remove because their mind wasn't right and their identity wasn't right. But now they saw Gideon just starting to walk in his identity. And as he started walking, they started believing. When you start walking, it's not just about you. It's about the people that God has called to see you 
It's about the people that God has placed around you. It's about the family that God has given you. They are looking at you. And so when you walk in the power and purpose God has given you and you look at yourself and you see yourself as fearfully and wonderfully made and chosen and set apart and holy and royal, when you start seeing yourself that way, they start seeing themselves that way. So you have to just keep walking. You have to just keep believing. And it says towards the end that it was just Gideon and the sword of the Lord. It was just him and God. God had to use all of these things to get Gideon to believe in who he was. And God knows exactly what he has to take you through to get you to believe. And sometimes it's going to be a battle. But it's only a battle because he has already given you the victory over it. He wants to fill the emptiness and loneliness you feel with the power that he has. He wants to fill that moment in time where you just don't even recognize who you are. He said, recognize who I am. He needed Gideon to lift up his eyes because he was just doing all the work in the beginning on the wine press, threshing wheat. His head was down. God said, I just needed you to look up. Look up to where your help comes from. Look up to where your victory is established. And it's so important that we just don't look at ourselves in situations, but we look at what God has purposed us for. Now, the reason why I named the title Hi, My Name Is is because I remember right around the time, and I actually forgot that I used to do this, and it it wasn't until I was in my final preparations Um, maybe like a couple days ago. And uh, when I really first tried to understand and believe who God called me to be, I had these little sticky notes that I would put on my mirror in my room. And then I also had like a little uh, like whiteboard. And I would just write down all the things that God called me. Hi, my name is Chosen. Hi, my name is Beautiful. Hi, my name is, it doesn't say this in the Bible, but uh, I heard it in my heart, so it was true. I am enough. Hi, I have purpose. Hi, I'm going to change my family. Hi, I'm going to change the circumstances that I'm around. What is your name this morning? What is your name? What is your name? Now, at the beginning, I shared a story about what truly started my identity crisis, because that's what it was. But I want to share with you guys an update. Can I do that? So maybe about six or seven years ago, Pastor, you might not even remember this. And that's why I say there's so many things I could say about this man that I would get choked up just trying to explain it all. But we were at an outreach, and I had just started to, you know, kind of be over the outreaches. And outreaches take a lot of work. I don't know if y'all know that. Um, But we got to communicate with communities, volunteers. We got to make sure we got resources. There's a whole lot of planning that goes into it. And so at outreaches, I'm walking around. I'm talking to everybody, and I'm smiling, and I'm happy, but my brain's doing 50 million things because I'm trying to make sure everything is where it needs to be, people are where they need to be, uh, making sure that, you know, everything is how it needs to be. And Pastor walked up to me, and we were talking about some logistics about the outreach, and he stops, and he goes, are you okay? I'm in the middle of the outreach, you know? (laughs) Like, your mind is focused. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm good. And, past, and the staff is going to laugh at me because he does this all the time. And he'll be like, are you sure? <laughs> and at, see, somebody's laughing, you know. And it's one of those things that after that, you can't lie. Like, <laughs> you, can't, you can't make up something. And so I said, you know, this week, my dad called. And he said he wanted to have lunch with me on Sunday. And I said, you know, I have church on Sunday, so you can come with me to church, and then we can do lunch. And he said, I would love to. Mm. And Pastor, you know, he does the like, 
and he's, he's listening. And I said, and I'm scared. I said, because this will be the first time since probably I was younger that we would have just one-on-one -on -one time, and I don't know what to expect. One, I don't know if he's really going to come because I've been around that circle. Yeah. Promise you're going to come, and you don't. I've been, on, I've, been on, I've been the kid on the step waiting. And so I'm not sure. And he said, well, this might be a time that God is trying to prepare. And he said, so go in, have lunch, and then just bring up how you feel. Don't bring, don't make it in an accusatory manner. Don't say you did this and you did that. No, just tell them how you felt and tell them how you feel. And then listen. Let him respond. Don't interject. Don't do anything. Listen. And I said, okay, okay. So the Sunday comes. He shows up to church. I was like, whoo, all right. That abandonment issue, okay, <laughs> starting, starting to heal. And, and after lunch, I made lunch, and we're sitting at the table, and then I just start to explain to him. And this is pretty much my, my demeanor. Most people that know me, this, this is my demeanor. So I'm just explaining to him, you know, these are the things that happened as a child, and, you know, it, it really messed me up. Like, I really wanted my dad to be there. I didn't understand. I didn't think he loved me. All of these things. And he listened. And shockingly enough, his personality is very much like mine. So we're just two listening people. Um, and so then he says, you know, I knew this conversation was going to come up. He said, and I also knew it was going to have to come up. And he said, I don't know what it was, but I knew I wanted to come and have lunch with you today. And I knew that this conversation was going to happen. And then he began to explain to me. And he said, you know, like when you were born, I was only like 19. I was about to turn 20. He said, you were my first kid. And he was like, my dad was there, but he wasn't really present. So I didn't really know how to be a dad, but I was just trying my best. Mm -hmm. And he said, and then just a couple years after that, my grandmother, who was his mother, passed away. And that was his best friend. My dad was the youngest of three boys of my, of my grandmother. And so he was the baby. And so... That was his, like, ride or die. And when she passed away, he said, I didn't even know what to do. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what my next move in life should be. Like, my whole life shattered. And he said, I didn't want the broken pieces that I was experiencing to cut you. He said, I ran away because... I didn't want you to see what I was becoming. I lost myself. And here I am, I'm thinking it's just he doesn't love me, it has to be me. But really, just like the enemy was using those people to say things, the enemy was using those fiery darts to cause this man to think that if I stayed, it would be worse off for my daughter that I want to give the world to. And I started to think, and if God knew who I was before I was formed, then maybe the enemy also knew. Yeah, that's good. And he was putting his plan together before I was born. He was putting his plan together before my dad was this born. I don't know my grandfather's story, but could it be that he also had a father that was battling with his identity and who he was and what he was supposed to do. And it was just this generational thing yeah. that kept going from person to person. Yeah. And could it have been that God was saying, I need you to have this conversation now so you can understand that it was never him, yeah. but it was the enemy that has been trying to get you to believe something that was false. Yeah. And sometimes he... You aren't even his attack focus. It was the generations before you yeah. and the generations after you that he's hoping to have an impact on. Yes. But what happens is there's always one. Yeah. There is always one. And maybe, maybe you are that one. 
Maybe God has you here, not just because he's trying to get your identity and perspective in order, but maybe he's saying, we have some generations to change. We have some things that have been replicated over and over and over again, and all he needs is you today. There are things that happen to you that God said they weren't meant to define you, but he's going to use that as part of your story to help the next generation. You had to go through that thing. You had to experience that thing. I know it doesn't feel good. I know it doesn't sound good. But God said, I already chose you. I already set you apart. I already appointed you. And I've appointed you to be a game changer. I've appointed you to be a giant slayer. I've appointed you to walk through fire, not smell like it. I've appointed you to be a sea splitter. I've appointed you to be a chain breaker. I've appointed you to be the person that's going to change the whole situation. And this morning, if you are ready to walk in the identity that God has already given you, that God has already purposed you, then I need you to make some noise for the God who is already on your case, for the God continue to walk side by side with you. You think you are lonely, but you're set apart. You think you are by yourself, but God said, I called you out. You are who he says you are, and you are nothing less. You are nothing less. Get ready to walk out of these doors and walk in power. Get ready to walk out of these doors and walk in purpose. Get ready to walk out of these doors and take on the destiny God has for you. That's all I have for you this morning.